So welcome everyone to our lesson preview for this week. And we uh, completed uh, the second lesson for this quarter. And uh, what a powerful lesson that was. Yeah, uh, this morning we studied the lesson for last week. And it was all about uh, Hosea, the king, right? And so this week we're going to be uh, studying uh, Isaiah, the, the seventh chapter. And so we welcome you all to our study and pray that you will uh, join us uh, as we look at another wonderful lesson and God's leading in uh, the early church. So before we begin, let's say a prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful and so thankful for another Sabbath day that we uh, have been given. We thank you for all the blessings that we've received this past week. And now we've come again to do a lesson preview study to talk about things eternal. And we pray that your Holy Spirit may open our minds and our thoughts so that we can truly see truth as it is. Thank you again, and we ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. So, as we were saying, uh, last week we... Uh, studied this wonderful lesson on Isaiah the king, Isaiah the king, and how that his leadership was totally uh, unacceptable. And we saw his, uh, his end, uh, he had leprosy, by wanting to uh, usurp uh, the position of the priest and thought that he could do that. But uh, all things that belong to God and that are, are holy is administered by his people that have been set aside. And so he had to learn that lesson the hard way. So, uh, as I said, we are looking at chapter 7 of the book of Isaiah. And um, we will see in this lesson now, this coming week, what not to do when you, your world is falling apart. What not to do when your world is falling apart? And the title, of course, of the lesson is When Your World is Falling Apart. We're going to see what Isaiah did when his world was falling apart and how God blessed him to recover from that. So as we start, let, let's put a little context to, uh, to what we're going to be talking about in, in chapter 7. So here we have the kingdoms of northern Israel uh, and Syria that were ganging up on Judah in the south. Israel, northern, and the northern uh, kingdom, and uh, the southern kingdom was Judah, and Syria to our right, and I didn't draw it in, but the Mediterranean Sea is right here. And so this is what we see. These two uh, uh, forces up here, the northern uh, kingdom, with Syria, ganged up together so that they can attack and fight and take Jerusalem and overthrow Judah. So this happened when Judah was weakened by attacks from the uh, Edomites and the Philistines that uh, already had come in there. In the past, Judah had fought against Israel, but an alliance between Israel and Syria presented an overwhelming peril. It appears that Israel and Syria wanted to force Judah to participate with them in a coalition against the mighty power of Tiglath-Pileser III of Assyria, who continued to threaten them with his expanding empire. So Israel and Syria had put aside their long-standing struggle against each other in view of a greater danger if they could conquer Judah, they thought, and install a puppet ruler there, 
that they could use its resources and its manpower and its uh, strategic location for their, their own self-gain. So that's what was going on. That's, that's a little context for us. So now, we, we, we put yourself in, in uh, King Ahaz's shoes, the king of Judah. Your kingdom is weak, and another kingdom is stronger, uh, uh, joins forces with a third kingdom to wage war against you. What do you do? What could you do? His world was falling apart. His world was falling apart. And we're going to discover how he went about finding a solution. He needed a powerful ally. He needed some help. He needed another strong nation nearby to help him overcome this dangerous situation. Who could he trust? Who could he trust? So, these uh, uh, two nations uh, just above him to the north, Israel to the north and Syria, they were bent on coming in and claiming Judah for themselves. And so, what did he do? What was Ahaz's solution when his world was falling apart? Well, this is what he did. He was so impious. He was so impious. And it's never good to be impious when you are in a situation where you need help. That, that, that the King Ahaz asked Assyria, a heathen nation, that had really nothing to do with God's people. He decided that he would ask uh, the king of Assyria for help, to help him. And it looked like it was a good idea to ask for help from this king. But this plan backfired. So let's read a, a couple of texts here in the Old Testament to help us along. Uh, in 2 Kings... We go to 2 Kings, and we're going to read in chapter 16, verse uh, 9. So it was all set, everything was done. He made this arrangement with the king of Syria, and in fact, he went the extra mile. He bribed this king to come over and help him, and he did something that he should not have done. He went and bribed him worth some trinkets uh, of his own wealth. And then he went into the temple of the Lord. And all those vessels, golden goblets and silver, he amassed them all together and he gave it to the, to the king of Assyria. That's what he did. But guess what? Let's read. Let's find out what happened. Second Kings chapter 16, verse 9 says this. So the king of Assyria heeded him, said, yes, okay, I'll come, I'll do it. For the king of Assyria went up against Damascus, and he took it, and he carried its people captive to Kerr. And he didn't stop there. He, he did what was asked for by Judah, by King Ahaz, and he went in, and he carried its people and took captive a cur. And he did something else. He killed Rezan. He killed the king. He killed the king. And, and, and that, that was a no-no. You can't do that. But that's what he did. That's what he did. So, let's read another text. 
Go to Second Chronicles. And when we go to Second Chronicles, and we read in chapter 28, verse 20. Chapter 28, verse 20 says this. Also, tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, came to him and distressed him and did not even assist him. Just came and did the job, didn't want to hear anything else. Uh, here in, in Chronicles it tells us. And he didn't want to hear anything more. Anything more. So, actually his plan now backfired. He took matters into his own hand, went to a heathen nature, uh, nation and asked for help. But that, this is what happened. This is what happened. This whole plan backfired on him. So, let's now continue to read uh, in chapter 7 of Isaiah. And we're going to read verses 3 through 9. Chapter 7, verses 3 through 9. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out now to meet Ahaz, you and Shear Jeshub, your son, at the end of the aqueduct from the upper pool on the highway to the fullest field, and say to him, Take heed and be quiet. Do not fear or be faint-hearted, for these two stubs of smoking firebrands for the, the fierce anger of Rezin and Syria and the son of Remaliah. Because Syria, Ephraim and the son of Remaliah have plotted against you, saying, Let us go up against Judah and trouble it, and let us make a gap in its wall for ourselves and set a king over them, the son of Tabel. And then in verse 7 it says, Thus says the Lord God, and he's bringing the message to them now. He said, It shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin. Within 65 years Ephraim will be broken, so that it will not be a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Ramelia's son. And if you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. So Ahaz took his impiety to the extreme. He was the first king of Judah. Now we must remember that, that, that Ahaz used to be a king that was obedient at first. But through the years, he was slack. He was slack. He wanted to adopt some of the, the, uh, the religious beliefs of the heathen people around. So much so that he was one of the first to sacrifice his own son to the idols. And we can read that in 2 Kings chapter 16, verse 3. But God let all these difficulties happen so that he could recognize his, his, his excessive madness and, and, and uh, playing back and forth with God. Then he's on and then he's off. Then he's on and then he's off. In fact, in Second Chronicles, it's always a good book to go to to see how his behavior was always. In Second Chronicles, again, we can read about that. Second Chronicles chapter 28, it's in the same book we were reading from. And verses 5 and 19 says this, Therefore the Lord, his God, delivered him into the hand of the king of Syria. They defeated him and carried away a great multitude of them as captives and brought them to Damascus. And then he was also delivered into the hand of the king of Israel who defeated him with a great slaughter. So, so God allowed these things to happen to him, and then God allowed the nations round about to, 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 to uh, raid, as it were, and to plunder 
and to take them as captives. So you have to learn. God always has a plan. When you do your own thing, you're going to, be, you're going to reap what you sow. And the lesson is there for us today. We, we live this up and down life, and we see a parallel between the early, early church, God's people, starting with the children of Israel way back then, and a parallel in the time we are living today. We are no different. Yeah, albeit on maybe on a, on a smaller scale, but, but we, we are the same. The up and down a play that we have with God, God says, whatever you sow, you're going to reap. Because we also think we have a plan. We have our own plan. We can defeat the devil on our own. And then God just has to let us go. And it never really turns out well when we do that. So, so Isaiah now visited Ahaz along with his son Shear Jehub. We just read that. God said, go to Ahaz and take with you your son, your son. And, and I, I want you to, to, to go and talk to him. He gave the king a message of hope. And he begged that the king would accept the message of hope. To trust in God's power. So, verse 3 and 4 says of, of, uh, of Isaiah says in chapter 7, verse 3 and 4 says that. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, go out now to meet Ahaz, you and uh, Shear Jehub, your son. Go out there, meet him, and then say to him to cool off. Take heed, be quiet, do not fear. Bring him this message from me. Because those dangerous kings, Pekka and Rezan, were just smoke for God. Even though in his eyes, in Ahaz's eyes, these two kings were, were, were volcanoes, ready to explode. God said to Isaiah, tell him that they are just, they are nothing to me. They are just stubble. They are just smoking firebrands. I am in charge. I am the Lord. I am your God. So, if Ahaz trusted God, if Ahaz trusted God, his kingdom would stand. His kingdom would stand. But what happened? What did he do? He, the test came and he did not trust. The test came and he did not trust in God. So, God said to him, and we're going to read again, we're going to read again, verses, verses uh, 10 through 13, and this is where God uh, steps out on a limb, and God cannot take it anymore. God says, now nah, I'm just going to, I will make the decision. He doesn't want to, I will make it. And so, Verse 10 says of chapter 7, and we read in this, these few verses here, chapter, 10, uh, chapter 7, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. This is what we read. It says, and it's called the Emmanuel prophecy. The Emmanuel prophecy there in chapter 10 through, through 13 and 14. And this is what it says. Moreover, the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. In other words, ask me a sign. Ahaz, I am your God. I want to help you. I, I want to be your right arm. Ask a sign. Just if you want to believe or know that it's true, Ask anything that is in heaven above or in the earth below. Ask me a sign and I'll show you a sign. But Ahaz said in verse 12, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. And then he said, Hear now, O house of David, 
Is it a small thing for you to weary men? But will you weary God also? So, God was willing to give Ahaz anything he asked. Anything he asked. God was willing. Because he wanted to light his heart with faith so that he can return to God and be the king that he once was. But Ahaz didn't want God to help him. He didn't feel like he wanted God to, to, to give him anything or show him anything. He closed the doors of his heart to faith. To faith. Yet again, we, 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 need, to, we need to pause. Because these lessons, friends, are written for us. If it's just a lesson in history, it's not beneficial at all. But we read and study God's word so that we can learn from it. We, we study the lives of these kings, these rulers of old, God's people, and we, we, we find a gem. We find something that will bolster our courage and strengthen our faith. So what he has lacked here was faith. He lacked faith. And so God said, I'm going to give you a sign. I'm going to give you a sign now. And so in verse 14, we read that sign. And, and, and God said, Therefore the Lord himself, it's as Isaiah speaking on behalf of God, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Wow. Wow. And this is why we call it the Emmanuel prophecy. Because here, he didn't want a sign, but God says, I'll give you a sign anyway. I'll give you a sign anyway. He said, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Hundreds of years before Jesus even came onto the scene of action. The prophecy was made through Isaiah the prophet. Wow. That prophet, that, that prophecy was made. And, and while we, we read the word virgin here, in this case, the, the, this word virgin is used in, in the verse, doesn't, doesn't imply sexual virginity or anything like that, of the virgin birth. When, when we read this verse here, way back then, hundreds of years before the, the, the virgin birth of Jesus, it was given. And, and that prophecy had two fulfillments. The immediate fulfillment, and then it had the future fulfillment. For the mother, for the mother in this prophecy, it was, it was Isaiah's wife. How do we know that? Because we read in Isaiah chapter 8, we skip over to chapter 8, and this is what we find there. In, in, in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 1, it says here, Moreover, the Lord said to me, Take a large scroll and write on it with a man's pen concerning Mehar Shalal Hashbas. That person, that boy, that will, after two years, be born to Isaiah's wife would be the immediate promise of this text in Isaiah chapter 7. And then in future, the future prophecy of the same thing would be the mother would be Mary. And when we look at Matthew way in the New Testament, how that came about, in, in Matthew, uh, chapter, Matthew chapter 1, this is what we read. Fan fantastic if you, if you look at it. So here in Matthew chapter 1, and we're going to read verse 20 through 23. 22 through 23. And it says, but while he thought about these things, talking about uh, Joseph, 
Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Verse 21, And she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. For, pardon me, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled. And yes, the prophecy being recognized here in the New Testament, hundreds of years after Isaiah. And here it is, verse 22. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. That's Isaiah, through the prophet. And this is what he said. And it refers us right to Isaiah chapter 7, 14. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. You can't beat the Bible. You can go against God's word. Because everything is in sync here. Prophecies have been made hundreds of years before will come true. And this is why God is asking us to have faith, to have trust. And if God's own people doesn't have it, if God's own leaders don't display faith and trust, if God's people don't have faith and trust in Him, it, it, it's, it's a, a, a lost cause. A lost cause. And yeah, hundreds of years later, here it is. The, the prophecy that Isaiah made in, in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Verse 14 came absolutely true. So, so here it is. Beyond the immediate and future fulfillments of the prophecy, it's also a universal promise that God is always with us. It's a universal promise. It says here, God will be with us because God, the, uh, the word Emmanuel, the name Emmanuel, is interpreted God with us. And when Jesus came, he became God with us. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we, we beheld him as we beheld the glory of God the Father. God is always with us, even when we are going through hard times. He's with us. So now we are going through COVID. Now we're going through COVID. All around us, it's, it's just doom and gloom. People are dying every single day by the hundreds. This is the time to have trust. This is the time to have faith. We look at our government. It's not doing any better. We look at who's in leadership now. Are they fighting right on the Capitol steps, right inside the Capitol building? There's a parallel between ancient Israel and God's people now. And the question is, how do you fare? The same God that was with Jacob in his tribulation, Genesis chapter 32, and with the three young Hebrews, many in the fire, don't, don't fret so much. God is with us. God will be with us in the fire. He will be with us through COVID. He will be with us through a new regime as the government changes hands in leadership. Don't be afraid. Trust God. It may look as if God is, is, is not in control here yeah? and things are just running its course and out of control. But God is always in control. So in a nutshell, that is the lesson for this coming week. Isaiah chapter 7. Wow, we see God at work. But God is depending on you and me to trust Him. And may our prayer be, as we fast and pray through this week, as our pastor brought that to us today, that, that we may truly serve and, 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 and trust Him and let Him know 
that we still love him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful and we are so grateful that we serve a living and a loving God. And when we study your word, both in the Old Testament and in the New, we see your hand at work, Lord, and we know that you are there. And we ask that you would uh, accept us. Please help through your Holy Spirit to strengthen our faith and help us never to forget that we do serve a loving and a living God. Oh, Father, we, we, we know that we come short, but we pray that you'll have mercy, that you'll have pity on us, and that you would bless us. Help us, Lord, to, to call for the faith that only you can give. And above all, help that each one of us may pray for each other and, 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 and uh, hold each other as it were and encourage one another to hold on because you are about to come and we want to be ready to go to heaven with you. Thank you for being so precious and so loving is our unworthy prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.